Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Trying to Figure It Out. I hope you all have had an amazing week. I know we were off last week, but I was honestly excited to give us a little break before this super exciting episode. This month is Pride Month, and to celebrate, we have a super special guest, self-proclaimed bisexual dream girl, Haley Jacobson. Welcome, Haley. Thank you. Thank you. Honored to be here. So excited to have you here. Haley is joining us from Brooklyn, New York. She is our first Zoom interview, and Mm -hmm. she has been working in New York on her debut novel, Old Enough, which is coming out in the summer of 2023 during Pride Month. Mm -hmm. Her writing is absolutely incredible. I highly recommend that you all check it out. Her writing focuses on subjects like mental health and sexuality and trauma and all different types of things that we all need to learn about and hear about and read about. So I'm so excited to have you here and can't wait to get into some of these topics with you. Me too. So So excited. You are a Gemini. Yes, I I am. That that matters to you. So I want to know what Gemini qualities you relate the most to. Oh my gosh. Um, I probably relate to all of them, but my favorite fun thing about being a Gemini is just that like, I really have that social butterfly quality where I just like, I could flit around a room and talk to every single person and ask them a million questions. And it just fills me up so much. I just love people. I love meeting people and um, I love to make people feel special. And I think that's also a very Gemini quality. It's like, you're the only person in the room if we're talking to you and Um, yeah, I'm just a big fan and I love like shattering the stereotype around Gemini's. Like we might look like there's nothing going on behind these eyes, but a lot's happening at lightning (laughs) speed. So, um, I just love it. We are both from Westchester, which we figured out in the funniest of ways. When I DM'd you, you were like, here, let's switch to text. And then you sent me your number and you had a 914 area code. Yes, I I do. So I was like. 914 gang, what's up? I have to ask you, what is your favorite Westchester spot? Oh my God, do I have any? Westchester is a lot of things for me. So it's like a complicated, a complicated thing. But I think honestly, I would say like my my dad's garden is my favorite place. So you were an only child. What was your relationship like with your parents when you were younger? So I have a really close relationship with my parents um, and I think we've always been close, but um, there is a funny, strange quality to being an only child where like, it's really just three of you. And um, that means that it's always like two against one. And I think that growing up, that was kind of a difficult dynamic for me to traverse through. And I think that there were so many wonderful things about being an only child, the like level of attention and care that I got, the level of privacy that I got, which is something that I still hold so dear to me today. Like my need to be alone and, and, and in private and just to have space to be with myself deeply with myself. But I think there was a lot of things that I look back and I sort of yearn for a big part of my journey with my parents, especially my mom. We had a growing apart and then we grew back together and that's been really lovely and um that was like a whole I think chapter of my my writing life was kind of exploring that relationship because when it's just two people in a house you know my dad was at work a lot of stuff can happen it's a very very intimate way of being and I I know that now from bringing partners home and just having them. I've never dated another only child. So just having people with siblings come and just experience what that kind of intimacy is. um, It's really different. I'm sure. I mean, that's definitely for me, a super interesting perspective to gain because I have a sister and my parents were divorced. So we spent a lot of time apart as Mm. siblings, but we still had each other. So that intimacy level that you're expressing is definitely different than what I experienced even yeah. though me and my sister were in a lot of different spaces at the different times right yeah. so to get into that you talked about how your writing explored a chapter where you and your mom kind of had a falling out and then grew back together so do you have a first memory of when you fell in love with writing 
I, I mean, according to my parents, I have been writing since like the second that I could. Um, I think maybe let's say that the first time that I fell in love with writing about my own life was sophomore year of college. I was, I went to theater school and I, you know, had dreams of being an actor and soon realized that what I really loved was playwriting and writing in general. And I took this class called autobiography where we wrote little plays about ourselves and our own lives. And it was just like, profound for me and it was like everything just broke open and um that was really the like initiation into the kind of writer that I am today I think before that I wrote a lot of stories and um poems and and things that weren't necessarily about me and my life I was kind of scratching the surface level um which was really good for developing skill and a love for you know, a certain style of writing, maybe like a pretty, like, you know, flowy kind of musicality to my writing, but I didn't go deep. And um, once I did, that was like, that was it for me. There was no turning back. Your writing obviously touches so much on mental health and your sexuality and all of that. So in what ways has writing helped you get through difficult times in your life? Oh my gosh, I think everything. I don't think that I've ever processed anything without writing about it. Writing can can unearth trauma out of the body. There's a, an entire major at Columbia or there was called narrative medicine, which is just founded upon like the science and belief that um, that trauma lives in the body. And when you write about it, you're writing it out of your body. Um, and I I just know that to be true. I, I always say to, you know, my students, like what secrets um, is your body keeping from you? And yeah. there's been so many secrets that have been revealed to me. I found, figured out that I was a survivor by writing something. And it wasn't until someone else heard me read it that it clicked for me what I was writing. And I have so many experiences like that. And I think like on the, on the opposite end, I can also just like really know how I'm doing mentally if my writing is a little bit all over the place. I, I really have noticed such a difference since being medicated and going to therapy about like the precision and the clarity of my writing and the ability to sort of anchor myself in times that I've been very sick. My writing was really just a whole bunch of nonsense to me. Um, and I think that's really interesting as well. So I just, I really know myself, I gauge myself through, through what I'm writing. Writing is almost like medicine and a doctor for you, because when you notice certain changes in your writing, you can like almost diagnose yourself with something that you might be experiencing. Totally. And then at the same time, you can cope through it without having to go to a doctor and it can yeah. serve as your medicine, which I think is so special and why like so many people who might have different writing skill levels or passions for it than you, you know, a lot of people still do turn to journaling or yeah. just spending a few minutes a day writing out their thoughts. And that's such a huge form of therapy. I like notice that journaling is hard for me because it hurts and it makes me feel sad to really reflect on some of the ways that I even yeah. feel about myself, but it's so like, it's beautiful and scary and so many different emotions when you go back to your writing and remember how you felt two days before a week before or even a year before and yeah. like how impactful it can be to see how you're changing or not changing and growing in so many ways yeah. so with that I wanted to ask you what tips do you have for people who are more like me who like I'm not a writer and journaling can sometimes be hard for me so what tips do you have for someone who is looking for motivation to journal to process and help themselves with times in their life that are hard yeah I think like the first thing that I would suggest which is what I teach my students is to kind of recognize how um, academia has like really fucked us in the head when it comes to writing. And I, I call it red pen syndrome, where we have so much PTSD around like our writing 
being, um, you know, at the, at the whim of, of someone else grading it. Um, and I just imagine like red pen slashing through essays and all of that stuff that we go through in school. Um, and I think that so much of like the mental block can be around the self-judgment and the desire to self-edit and writing when it's in its sort of purest form is a thing of the body. And it's just like, I mean, I think of it as like, it's flowing from your heart to either your voice or your heart to your hand when you're typing or you're writing. Um, and I think that like, when we, when we, stop ourselves with these very like cerebral heady um notions of what writing should be that's when we just have no passageway to get the things on the page that we really want to process so I think number one having a lot of grace for yourself and recognizing like oh like we're all fucked up like this is not like, this is not going to be handed into a teacher. This is private. This is for me. There is no good or bad. It's just like me reflected on the page. I think that that can be a huge breakthrough for folks. And then if you're just struggling with the writing process, I love writing prompts and writing prompts are so easy to find. And there's such a great way in. And I really recommend setting a timer and playing music if you're a music person. And, um, I also really think like you, if you do like 10 jumping jacks and then sit down to write, like you'd be so surprised what comes out because again, it's a thing of the body. So when we get the body moving and the breath going and the blood pumping, sometimes that's when we can just release. And so that's another thing I love to recommend. That's so helpful for me too. I just got the five minute journal oh, yeah. I'm trying that out now. And I'm honestly really liking it. I like the concept of it. And I think that the prompts are super helpful. So for anyone listening who is looking for somewhere to start, I think that can also be a great place yeah. for sure. Yeah. You've been open about managing your mental health. When was the first time that you noticed yourself struggling with anxiety or depression or just overall mental health issues? I'll start it by saying that I have both clinical depression and OCD. And I think OCD has been like this missing component that I was only diagnosed with two years ago. So now I look back everything in retrospect, I look back through this lens of understanding OCD and how it's manifested in, in my brain and body. So it's sort of been like this missing link, but um, I think it really started at the end of my freshman year of college. I think finally being away from home, a lot of stuff was starting to come up for me. Um, and also just my brain chemistry was changing. But I think what's unique to my story is that my mom has depression and she's had depression my whole life. And um, she actually was diagnosed with depression when I was born because she had post severe, severe postpartum depression. And so I grew up with a lot of language around depression. And I grew up with a lot of understanding um, that it, it was okay to have a mental illness and that medication was okay. And that um, like, it was not a stranger to me. I have seen my mother go through maybe seven or eight bouts of, of, of dark depression. And so when it hit me, kind of knew what was going on. Um, but I didn't really want to tell mom because I didn't want to like burden her with that. So it took me probably like six to eight months to finally tell her. But as soon as I did, she found me an amazing therapist and I saw that therapist for eight years and then eventually went on medication, which totally changed my life. And then finally, finally, I figured out that the one missing element that I couldn't quite put my finger on is that I have, I, I really have OCD. It's really a lot, a lot of it, a lot, a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess that's my long-winded winded, uh, way of saying um, probably 1920. And then I feel like I've gone through maybe three depressive episodes and, and probably like three big OCD sort of mental breaks. Um, but I'm so much, I'm so much better now. And I think that my OCD and my depression were really, really linked. 
Um, and so now that I see that and I have the OCD under control or rather I'm in recovery, I don't foresee myself falling into a depression anytime soon, but I also do not go off my meds and I never plan to. So that's a big part of it for me. First off, thank you for sharing. I mean, it's why I started this podcast was to talk about stuff like this in such a free space. My own journey with my own mental health has not been a linear one at all either. I was diagnosed with anxiety very, very young. I have panic disorder and I never was medicated for it until 2020. Yeah. And once I started taking medication, my whole life literally changed. I mean, I was able to do things that I never thought I'd feel comfortable doing or yeah. safe doing. Sleeping at night was different. Everything felt so different. But then I, in the last eight months have honestly been in a depressive mm. episode. I mm. am outside of it now at this point, mm. I'm coming yeah. out of it. And I, it was just really interesting for me because I think I believed that with my medication and all of that, that it didn't make sense or wasn't something that could happen. But I think it might've been something that I'd always been struggling with, but never spent time focusing on because my anxiety was just so much more prevalent and obvious and, you know, it's been a journey the last eight months. I am still trying to figure my brain out and yeah. what makes me feel good and what like changes I have to make to my life to feel safe and happy and, you know, able to get out of bed every day. Because for me, the way it manifests is just some days it's just absolutely impossible to yeah. do anything. Yeah. How would you say that your depressive episodes or states and just depression overall manifests for you. I mean, it's so interesting how you're speaking about, like, I, I always look at anxiety as like, it's sort of like this outside layer. And then sometimes there's some stuff underneath it. And my partner, Carter, is a therapist. They have anxiety as well. And so we talk about like, just sort of like what's underneath that and what, you know, what's going on. And I think it's so common that folks who have anxiety, which is kind of like an upper, right? It's a very like adrenaline filled heart beating fast, panic inducing kind of disorder. It's like masking the depression that's kind of laying dormant and it's like a survival tactic almost. And then once that's stripped away and you get into the guts of the depression, which is really without that same panicky feeling a lot of the time. I think that that's really fascinating. So I just want to validate that, like, that's so normal what you're going through, but like also kind of points to the fact that like, you're getting, you're getting down into those layers. You're right. Cause my anxiety does manifest in being very upbeat, always having to do way too much. Yeah. Like my schedule is packed yeah. from the minute I wake up till the minute I go to sleep. And I think that my medication and all of that allowed me to really slow down a little bit and feel comfortable slowing down. But now I feel like almost like a year into it, almost like anxiety is an umbrella. And then I removed the umbrella and it, this is what's underneath. And it really rocked me. Cause I was like, whoa, I've never felt this way before. And it was just something that I had to really feel the feels and I'm still feeling it yeah. and just trying to work on it every single day in ways that I'm not used to. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Such, it's such a cloud, cloud covers. Yeah. yeah. I'm so sorry, but I, there's a lot of, there's a lot of hope. I think for me, you know, it's been a long time, I think, since I've experienced a, a depressive episode, I think OCD is my my beast right now. I focused a lot of my writing for a long time on depression, not so much anymore, but my favorite quote is by the author Andrew Solomon, who is a fantastic writer who really, really has struggled in his life with, with um, clinical depression. He says, the opposite of depression is not happiness, it's vitality. Vitality, you know, being this will to live or just the ability to live. And I think for me, whenever I was depressed, I really, I lost that sense of vitality, that, that desire to show up in my body day to day. Um, and totally. that, I mean, it just skews your perspective on everything. Everything you watch is from this existential lens and it's, um, it's really, really just such a heavy, hard feeling. And so for sure. For me, though, what's really interesting is that OCD is what 
spiraled me into depressions. So because OCD is so, so, so hard to manage when you have no language or understanding of it, it's such a manic obsessive kind of disorder that at a certain point, your brain and body just completely give out. And I think what now looking back, I see that my obsessive tendencies and ruminations put my body under so much stress that it just completely shut down and put me in an yeah. into depressive episodes. So we never caught that first part because we were so focused on the second part. My therapist missed it. My psych missed it. And now it makes so much sense. Um, so, we'll, so, you know, will I ever be depressed again? Probably it's a long life, but um, I'm, yeah. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at with that journey. It's really nice to hear the perspective of someone who has OCD. That's not something I've experienced. And it's just nice to hear the perspective of someone who is so open about their mental health, because that is exactly what I'm trying to do with this space. And yeah. it's something that I've been open about since I was a kid and I didn't really have the same dialogue in my family. It did take a long time for me to feel safe or comfortable to say, I need to be medicated for this. Yeah. So yeah, I want to ask you and talk a little bit more about your OCD if you're comfortable with it, because sure. it's definitely... I think that the ways in which you experience your OCD based on what I've seen in your writing and all of that is definitely stuff that I know that I'm not a hundred percent familiar with. And I know my listeners would love to know more about it. I think like starting this with just a light education of what OCD is and what it really is, is, is helpful because it's, it is, it's such a different beast to understand. And it's just really not in the dialogue at all because what folks think of as OCD, what we see um, represented thus far is sort of your classic case of um, like a, a compulsive touching, um, like the, you know, checking the doorknob three times or washing your hands compulsively or checking the stove a million times. Um, that's what we see, which is like, yes, those are compulsions. Um, and, you know, people think of OCD as, you know, needing to be really neat and tidy and clean, which honestly, it's not about for those people, that's called contamination OCD. It's really not about being neat and tidy. It's about a, 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 a deep terror of um, being contaminated by something. So the number one thing is OCD is not an adjective. OCD does not describe a quirk. It does not um, describe someone who is particular and likes a minimalist lifestyle. Um, OCD is one of the top 10 most debilitating disorders um, in the DSM in, in, in the world. Um, and it consists of um, excruciating desires to engage in compulsive behavior. And um, the, the dialogue that we don't have around OCD is around what is called pure O. Pure O is the mental manifestation of OCD in folks who have the disorder. That's what I have. I have pure O. Um, and there's lots of themes under the pure O umbrella. And really your brain can fixate on whatever theme it, it chooses to. Um, but some examples would be harm OCD, the fear that you are going to hurt or kill the people around you, pedophilia, OCD, the fear that you um, are a pedophile, sexual orientation, OCD, which can go in any direction you want to, fear of being gay, fear of not being gay, um, health OCD, the fear that you are sick or dying or both, um, and scrupulosity, OCD, obsession with religion, um, oftentimes that's, you know, paired with, uh, just really being obsessed with spirituality, um, or confession or doing things the right way. There's so many more themes. I have struggled in the past with spirituality OCD. That was 
pretty devastating for me because I was unmedicated and not in therapy. And it led me into the deepest depression I've ever been in. So I was fixated on God and spirituality for almost a year of my life. And now I struggle with relationship OCD and sexual orientation OCD. The important thing that people don't understand is that OCD is ego dystonic, meaning it attaches onto things that go against the morals and values that a person has. Someone with pedophilia OCD probably isn't a pedophile. And I, I say probably because if anyone with OCD is listening to this, that is like that's, that is how we engage with OCD. There's no absolutes. It's, it's the doubt disorder. It's the uncertainty disorder. So when I say maybe it's really just for the folks out there listening, but most likely, most certainly they are not a pedophile. This is something that goes deeply against their values. They are probably someone who loves children, who sees children as so special and so dear, but it's such a taboo topic, pedophilia, and the brain loves to attach onto anything taboo, and the OCD brain is obsessed with it. So these these hard hitters like pedophilia, harm, and sexual orientation, which are so, so taboo, so insidious, Um, this makes the disorder a double whammy for folks and they tend to never talk about it because they don't know what the fuck is going on. When you have nonstop intrusive thoughts, questioning your reality, your existence, whether or not you are a good and moral person, questioning whether or not you care for the people around you, um, whether you're lying to the people around you, it is... It is the most destabilizing, painful, tortuous thing that I could ever experience. And I know it is the exact same way for every single person I've ever met with OCD, Uh, especially when you have the taboo themes. It's the amount of shame that comes with it is just devastating. Um, And people go undiagnosed because they're so, so scared to talk about it. And there's no representation in the media. So for me, I kind of have this stance now that I'm in recovery. I'm like, yes, my brain fixates on questions like, am I gay? Am I not? Does God exist? Does God not exist? Is this relationship right for me? Is it wrong for me? I say it so casually because that's part of the recovery is to sort of take a stance like, huh, okay, interesting, maybe. When in reality, in the throes of these obsessions, it is it is the only thing that you can focus on. And it is just soul ripping and soul crushing. Um, and that's where the compulsions come in. So a lot of times it's just constant thought and rumination. What if, what if, what if seeking reassurance, wanting people to tell you, no, you're not a pedophile. No, you're not going to kill anyone. Googling, Googling's my big one. I don't let myself Google anymore. You know, I could be on Reddit for like eight hours nonstop. Um, and, and there are so many compulsions um, that people engage in. Um, so that, that, yeah, that is my, that is my uh, brief education on OCD. And we, we can go from there if you have more questions. Oh, I mean, thank you. That is like such an amazing and well-spoken and clear explanation of something that I know that so many people either know nothing about or know something that's not correct about or only think it's one specific thing. So even I just learned so much in everything that you just shared and I'm really grateful to have you here to share this stuff with everyone. And I'm sorry that you've had these really debilitating experiences. I can't imagine how that feels. And I'm so glad to hear that you're in recovery and in a better place and I just hope you continue on this journey of creating a space for people to learn and relate and feel safe and validated. Yes. I think that's so important and such a missing piece to all mental health disorders, but especially this one. Yeah. I think like, you know, if there is anyone listening who is wondering, oh, is this me? Or, you know, if their mind is racing a mile a minute hearing this, just knowing, you know, what I would have wanted to hear is that like any thought that you have is okay. Like 
I know those intrusive thoughts feel like the worst thing you've ever experienced and that you could never tell anyone and you're so ashamed, but um, like I promise there is a world where recovery is possible and um, the if you have OCD, the gold star treatment is ERP. I promise you nothing else works. Please don't go to talk therapy for it. Go to ERP, see a specialist, get in group therapy. You're not alone. This is a very specific disorder. It's a completely different language than how we talk about any other kind of recovery and mental illness. It's hard work, but nothing is scarier than OCD itself. So once you're in recovery, I promise you, you've already faced your worst fears. So anyone's listening, please go on iocdf.org and learn more about getting an ERP specialist. Since I was diagnosed with depression, I really have been considering going to group therapy. I've just been told that it can be so unbelievably therapeutic and different than talk therapy. And I've been in talk therapy since I was seven years old and I've tried cognitive behavioral therapy, so many different types of therapies, but I really have been like fixated on this idea of going to group therapy, but haven't totally had the courage to do it. But I just wanted to ask you if you wanted to share a little bit about the specific benefits of group therapy. Yeah, it's life-changing. It's like probably one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Um, I've seen people make so much progress. People who have been in therapy for like you a decade, decade plus make like leaps and bounds just from being validated by other people and just for feeling seen and feeling comfortable talking about being in the lowest of the low places. And, um, I mean, if like, I can go to group where I talk about, you know, my scariest thoughts and my dear friend who's in group can talk about her obsessions with, you know, pedophilia, like (laughs) we're all, we're all out there. There's space for all of us. So like, I think that um, whatever's stopping you, like people have done it before you. So there's no reason why you can't do it too. It's like something I've really been thinking about a lot. In your Instagram bio, you introduce yourself as an OCD princess. Yes. I want to ask you what that means to you. For me, you know, putting labels in my bio, I think is really just helpful for people to be like, oh, this is what I'm going to get here. Um, But I think, OCD is, has so much shame attached to it and has, you know, it's looked down upon or people are confused by it or people think it's weird. And I think if you like see this, like the hot girl who's comfortable with herself and her body and living a beautiful and full life, who just names truthfully and proudly that she has OCD and that, you know, she's OCD royalty, whatever I've decided to do there. I think it kind of like is a little trippy for people and I think it pulls them in. And I think, um, like, I just want to own it. It's just my reality. When I came across your page and found you, I was like, wow, I need to like, you see someone's bio. That's the first thing you see. So I can relate to that being like a way to just show people who you are and what they're going to on your page. Thank you guys so much for listening to part one of trying to figure it out with Haley Jacobson. I know I said part one, you guys are just going to have to wait till next week to hear the rest. This interview was so impactful for me and so special that we decided to break it into two episodes so that you guys could really soak in everything that we talked about. Can't wait for you guys to hear the rest next week.